Uh, this morning we want to conclude a, a series we've been in, I think this is the sixth or seventh week, and uh, the title of the, of the series has been called The Air Up There. It was really birthed by something that God was dealing with me on in my own heart from the Word of God, and, and that went along with a dream that one of our staff members had, not just, a, you know, not just an ordinary dream, but a spiritual dream. And I'm not going to take time to relate the dream to you, but if you go to week one, uh, and I'd encourage you and invite you to do that if you want to, uh, you can hear the description of what the dream was and the spiritual meaning. But basically it said this, we need to be alert We need to stand to attention, we need to rally together, and we need to march forward and take a hold of everything that God has for us as individuals, as a church, and as a nation. Look at the person next to you and say, are you awake this morning? And and the scripture that the Lord gave us was Revelations 4 and verse 1 and 2. Let's just read through it quickly. Uh, as, we, uh, as we dive into the, the subject of this morning. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, say the first voice. Amen. Say the first. Amen. All right. The first voice that I heard was like a trumpet. And what was this first voice that was like a trumpet? It is indeed the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was like a trumpet and it said, come up here and I will show you things that must take place after this. And immediately I was in the spirit. That statement I was in the spirit speaks of a heightened state of spiritual sensitivity or an increased state of spiritual awareness. And behold, a throne set in heaven and one that sat on the throne as, and one that sat on the throne. So I want you to think about with me this morning, and, and, and the message of, of this morning's um, message, the subtitle is, First of All. First of all. Would you look at the person next to you and say, First of All. You see, as we follow the instructions and apply the principles of the Word of God, we will start to get results in our lives. But that means we've got to learn to put first things first. So I want to talk to you today about the principle of first. You see, if we follow God's word, if we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, if we put first things first, then we can expect to receive the things that God has provided for us. So turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, I'm going to read the first two verses, and we'll, we'll see something interesting that will jump out at, at us here as Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, therefore... I exhort, I plead or encourage, first of all, say first of all, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Notice, The purpose why Paul said that first of all, we should make prayer, supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. What was the purpose? The purpose is that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. In other words, he's saying, if we'll pray for our leaders, if we'll do this first of all, then the gospel of Jesus Christ will continue to be able to be spread in an atmosphere of peace, in an atmosphere of godliness. Because if you look at nations where there's wars, where there's fighting, where there's sedition, where there's conflict, how you know it is very difficult for the gospel to go forward. Look at the person next to you, say first of all. Now, first means first. Not second, not third, or not when I remember. And he says, first of all, and he lists four things. He lists prayer, supplication, and intercession, and giving of thanks or thanksgiving. He lists four things that we should be doing as a believer. Every believer, first of all, should be doing this. And I think sometimes we find ourselves on the wrong end of circumstances because we kind of get the cart before the horse. And how you know, if we want to see the results 
of God's word, if we want to see God's purposes unfold in our lives, then I want you to, we've got to do first things first. Look at the person next to you. Say, first of all. Now, I know what happens when we pray because I, I'm a human as well, and, and I understand when, when I start to pray, most often the first thing I do after thanking God for His goodness is I start to pray for my family, my needs, my circumstances. And, and, and I understand that because how you know those things touch my life. But notice what Paul says. Paul says, listen, don't start with the inward things. Start with the furthest thing from your mind First of all, pray for the leaders of your nation. Pray for those who maybe you don't touch and they don't touch you personally, but ultimately they affect your life by the decisions they make. Turn through to Haggai chapter one, and, and I want to show you uh, the outcome sometimes of what happens when, when believers or when the church forgets to put first things first. In, in, in chapter one, verse four, The prophet Haggai is speaking to the nation of Israel, and and that basically represents the church in the context of what we're speaking about. And look what he asks them. He says, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple lies in ruins. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into bags with holes in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Can can I ask you to very nicely and, and kindly and with the biggest smile on your face, turn to the person next to you and say, consider your ways. Okay, forget about being nice. Just tell them straight like it is. Say, consider your ways. The, The prophet Haggai is basically saying, when there's an element of deep dissatisfaction in your life, when you're not seeing the results of the word in your life like you know you should, Now, all of us go through things, so you've got to discern this. We all go through circumstances. We all go through challenges. But when there's this deep dissatisfaction, this this deep longing for something more, it very often can be an indication that you're not attending to your spiritual life. Can I have a good amen from this beautiful church this morning? I haven't preached for three weeks in this pulpit, so I'm really excited. I'm really passionate and I'm stirred up, so forgive me if I get on your case this morning. If I stand on your toes, we do have a healing line at the end of the service. (laughs) So so how do I build God's house? How, How do I interpret this in the light of the new covenant because that's an old covenant scripture and, and how you know they were still living under the curse. So how do I bring this into the new testament? Well, what, what I believe God's really saying to us, you've got to build the church. And who is the church this morning? Say, I am the church. You are the church. I'm the church. So how do I build God's house? How do I attend to the spiritual things? Number one, I build my life in Christ. I develop and grow in my spiritual walk. I think there's so many of us today in the church, we're so busy with life. We're so busy with life and then we try and add Christianity. No, you need to be busy with Christianity and let life be added onto you. Come on church, let's get excited together for the things of God today. Number two, I build, my, I build God's house by building other people. In Christ. Let's, let's look from where we are, we've got to build our lives, then we've got to start building the lives of the people around us, the people in our community. And then thirdly, I build the house of God. I tend to spiritual things by making sure I'm building my local church. The local church is the hope of the world. And I'm telling you right now, that is God's Not just his A plan, his B plan, but it's his only plan. His only plan is you and I. And that means that that, that I, as a believer, say I. I. That's the last time you can use the word I in this service. But I need to make sure that I am serving 
in the local church. And how do I serve in the local church? I bring my time, I bring my treasure, and I bring my talent. And in some way, I need to bring all of those. And you need to interpret that in the light of your world, in the light of what God's leading you to do. Because how you know, all of us have got different lives at different phases of different stages. So I'm not putting a, a condemnation on you, you know, that you've got to be doing whatever, but bring your time, your treasure, and your talent to your local church. Because when you do that spiritually, have a look what happens in Matthew 6, verse 33, and I'm reading out of the CEB translations, because I want to get some points this morning with my wife. <laughs> and she loves the CEB translation. Mandy? Verse 33. Instead, desire first, I love the way it puts this, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all these things, say things, things. will be given to you as well. Uh, the New King James or King James says they'll be added. They'll be added. Seek first, desire first, go after God's way of being and doing right and the things will be added. So God's not saying, I don't want you to have things. God's not saying, I don't want you to enjoy your life. God's not saying, I don't want you to have other interests. He just doesn't want those things to be first. Say with me, say, first of all. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has, an enough, tr has enough trouble of its own. Isn't it amazing that Jesus links worry, free living, with putting first things first. He says, if you, if you first of all do the things you need to do, the other things will take care of themselves. Number two, when we stand up and we put first things first, we start to get into sequence and we get things in order that God can unlock the next thing that you need for your life. Say the next thing. And number three, when, when we put first things first, it also locks out what the enemy will try and use to destroy your life. Are you getting some help this morning? Look at the person next to you, say, we love our pastor. So I wanna, I wanna continue this morning for, in the time that we have, and I wanna talk about the incredible power of a quiet time. The incredible power of a quiet time. Because... I don't know if you realize this, but everything rises and falls on your quiet time. It really does. Uh, the reason I'm still serving God, the reason I'm still vibrant today, the reason I still believe God is working with me and being gracious to me is because every day he draws me into his presence. And it's not about my quiet time, it's about me wanting to spend time with him because he loves you so much. And so we want to just introduce to you a very simple uh, concept and idea, and, and, and many of you might know it, and, and if you do know it, you're going to be so excited because it's just going to confirm what you're already doing, and it's going to inspire you to do it more. And if you've never seen it, hopefully it's going to inspire you and help you to develop the power of a quiet time, and it's called the prayer wheel, the prayer wheel. And... Uh, this has been such a blessing in my life. I remember nearly 30 years ago when I got saved, actually 31 years ago to be precise, uh, I remember doing the basic concepts course. And in this basic concepts course, they introduced the prayer wheel. And, and I've been serving God for a while and, 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 and God had touched my life and I was experiencing the life of God and the goodness of God. But really my prayer time wasn't that much. I mean, I'd pray for myself, I'd pray for my family, I'd pray for the church, and, and, and three and a half minutes later, my prayer time was over. And you know, one day when I got to four minutes, I thought, wow, Larry, you are a spiritual giant. You spent four minutes with God this morning. And I was serious. But when, when I was introduced to this prayer wheel, I started to realize prayer firstly encompasses a lot more than just talking to God about my needs. I realized as well that, that if, if I took this prayer wheel and kind of used it as a, as, as a program for my life, just as I'm, I'm getting used to serving God, if I'll just spend five minutes on each of these 12 segments, I would have spent an hour with God. And I was like, how could I ever spend an hour with God? I, I, I mean, I'd, I get bored after six minutes if, if it's not really exciting. Can you ask Mandy? 
I'm a bit OCD when it comes to certain things. I'm like, okay, what's next? We've been doing this now, what's next? I mean, for me to sit in a car for four hours with Mandy driving, you've got to know, I have grown a lot. <laughs> yes, I admit, I did break a few times and, and I did take the steering wheel over a few times and so on, but I've grown a lot. But, but I could spend an hour with God and, and I want you to know, if you'll, if you'll develop this, it's not a, it's not a formula, it's, it's a help tool. And, and I've learned as I've, as I've grown over the years that there's some times where you just spend an hour in worship, and that's fine. And, and then there might be times where you just spend an hour studying the Bible. But I realize that, that if I don't, I've got all these aspects of prayer, of, of my quiet time that inspire me. And, and when I get inspired to spend time with God, God gets inspired, and He can deal with your life, and He can shape your life, and He can talk to you about your life. Are you okay with that? All right, so let's, let's get into it this morning. We're gonna, we're gonna start this morning with, with four segments which I would call like the driving force of my prayer wheel and they, they are indeed praise, which you'll see your, your prayer time starts with praise and ends with praise. Why? Because we always wanna put God first and praise is all about honoring God. And then we want to deal with uh, segment seven and eight, which is worship and thanksgiving. We're going we're gonna to put those four together this morning, and, and we want to just start off with that. Now, in Ephesians 5, verse 18 to 20, it says this, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me, let me just give you a, a, a little definition. Praise, praise is all about celebrating and declaring what Jesus has done in your life. Praise is always vocal and it's always full of action. You, you cannot tell me you're praising God if you're doing this. Pastor, I praise quietly. I praise inward. No, you're not praising. Because if I wanted to honor Mandy and I got up and said, guys, you know, I've got an amazing wife. Uh, we're just going to honor her today. She's an incredible woman. Awesome. Let's give her a round of applause. You're going to say, what did, you, what did you honor her for? Tell us something about her. Tell us what she does that makes her an awesome woman. Tell, tell us how come you say that she's awesome. So if you're not telling people about God, if you're not vocal, if you're not demonstrative, you're not praising. Wow, that went over really well. Uh, I'm just going to move along. To worship. Worship is giving of yourself to God. John 4 says, those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. So worship is all about honoring God. Praise is, is vocal and demonstrative because it takes faith. You don't feel anything. You don't see anything. You don't really know what's happening. But when you enter into worship, God has now honored your faith. You're in the presence of God. You're completely and, and con uh, totally enamored with God's presence. You're not aware of anything else going around you because it's just you and Jesus, just you and the Father just you and worship. The woman with the alab alabasca box. She came and broke it over Jesus and everyone else wanted to have something to say. But, but Jesus said, no, this woman has come with worship. It's a picture of when we, when we worship, it's breaking ourselves before God. It's, it's unlocking who we are. It's, it's not worried about the inhibitions of what other people think. It's coming, and I want you to, when you start to do that, God starts to move in your spirit. God starts to move in your circumstance. God starts to move. As a matter of fact, even if he doesn't move, it doesn't matter because it's just you and God. Look at the person next to you and say, we're tight. No, I don't mean like you're tight. I mean like we're tight. Come on, look at the person on the other side and say, we're tight. That's worship. And thanksgiving, thanksgiving is about remaining constantly grateful to God, for God, on a daily basis. 
And notice that uh, I, I don't think there are many scriptures in the New Testament that speak about prayer, praise, or worship that don't somewhere link it with thankfulness. Because you see, if, if you and I aren't first thankful, we're going to find it very difficult to praise and to worship God. Let me tell you about thankfulness that I've noticed in my own life and in the lives of others. People, when people start to live with unthankfulness, in other words, they're not, they're not living with that attitude of gratitude. There's two things that happens. Number one, they, their lives either start to drift towards complaining, and you start to listen to their tone, listen to their spirit, listen to their souls, and you'll see everything's tainted with a complaint or, or, or with, you know, if they did this or why didn't that happen, and, 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 and it's like they drift towards a lifestyle of complaining. Look at the person next to you say, it's definitely not you. It's for those folk who didn't come this morning. Or listen, the other opposite is a person starts to drift to a sense of entitlement. That's what happens when we're not thankful. And I want you to know that if, you, if there's something that hinders what God's doing in your life, it's an unthankful heart. All right, can we move on? Number two, the second segment is confession. Remember, we, our aim or our, or our desire with this is just to, to develop the power of a quiet time. And, and if you'll just take five minutes on each of these through the day, and maybe you want to divide it up into three 20-minute segments. But, but if you just spend five minutes on each of these, you're not just going to develop a quiet time, but you're going to develop a culture of prayer and relationship with God. As a matter of fact, let me make you this promise. If you haven't done this yet, if you'll do this for the next 30 days, one hour a day with God, I promise you, you'll come back to me and you'll say, my life has changed. If it hasn't, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's a money back guarantee. Number two, second segment, confession. Confession. So the, the first segment and the last segment is praise. My, my, my quiet time starts with praise and it ends with praise. But number two, we speak about confession. Now, most people, when they hear confession, they go negative. You know, I must tell God about my sins and I must confess all my shortgivings. No, no. Confession needs to primarily be faith-driven. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. I'm reading out of the Amplified. Let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is reliable, trustworthy, and faithful to his word. Confession always needs to be weighed out with positive faith confessions. Yes, there's a small segment. If, if you've messed up today, if you've done something you shouldn't, yes, you go to God and say, Lord, man, I, I, I really missed it there. I'm, I'm sorry. There's a place for that, but that's not what your life should be involved in because some people, I mean, they confess so much, I wonder if they're even saved. And most of that's based, no, listen, most of, that's, most of it's based on a sense of condemnation and guilt. They wanna confess just in case God maybe has got something against them, so they kind of cover all the bases. <laughs> I did that for years. I was like every day confessing, Lord, if I had a wrong thought, Lord, and if, if I said this to my wife or I looked wrong, Lord, forgive me. And, and, and my confession was based on a negativity. And you know what that does? It destroys your faith and it robs you of your confidence. All right, number three, I can't delve into a lot, a lot of these. We could probably do a week on each of them. So I'm just gonna put someone out there. Third segment. Say third segment. Yes. Come on, church, be happy. Look at the person next to you, give them a nice big smile. Yeah, come on, just remind them that you brushed this morning. <laughs> Say, I use Colgate. <laughs> or some of you are saying that's getting really scary. But... Um, Come on, let's just be happy this morning. God is good. God is on our side. We're going over, not under. We're another, above and not beneath. Our God is on the throne. Jesus rules. Hallelujah. Number three is tongues. Put your tongue out. Tongues. Okay, not that kind, but 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2 says this, again in the CEB translation. CEB translation. This is because those who speak in a tongue 
Don't speak to people, but to God. No one understands it. They speak mysteries by the Spirit. Verse 4, people who speak in tongues build up themselves. Those who prophesy build up the church. I want you to know, church, that we're a church who believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We believe in the leadership and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I had a a gentleman, I won't tell you his name and I won't say too much about him because it's not to expose him, but he came and sat with me about two weeks ago and and he left our church just over a year ago and and ultimately the, the real truth is he left the church because he didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he went to another church and he's been at that church for a year and he sat with me almost in tears and he said, Pastor Larry, I don't know how any church or anyone can live without the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the fullness of the Spirit operating in their lives. Now, I'm not, I'm not coming against any other whatever. What I'm just saying is, I've experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've experienced the life of the Spirit and I want to know, I can't live my walk with God without it. is all I can say to you. (laughs) Paul said this, listen, Paul said this, I speak in tongues more than you all. And I wish that you would experience that. And, And if you think I'm trying to convince you, yes, I am. Absolutely I am. I promise you I am. Are you convinced this morning? Because when I know when, when I've had a tough day, when like this morning I got up and uh, you know, I really felt a bit tired. We've had a crazy week. We came from holiday and I feel like I need another one. I know how some of you feel. You haven't had a holiday all year, so let's not even go there. But, but it's been a busy week and we haven't had a lot of sleep and I, I wasn't sure. I said, Lord, I haven't spent the time for this morning that I would normally like to spend because we've been out preaching and doing meetings. And I just started praying in my heavenly language and I promise you, five minutes. And just God's refreshing came into my spirit and just lifted me up and just encouraged me. You see, there's, there's a power there. There's a gift there. And that's why the enemy does his best to keep people away from it. Number four. Segment number four is petitions. Petitions. And, and, and I want to encourage you with this. It says, first of all, let prayer supplication Intercession and giving of thanks be made for all men. But I want you to know the scripture also says in the New Testament, God wants to hear about your needs. God is interested in the things that are going on in your life. As a matter of fact, God is interested in the most minute, small, insignificant detail of your life. And you can talk to him about that. We're not talking about, you know, feeling embarrassed or or condemned because you've got needs. No, God wants access to your life. As a matter of fact, petitions is all about giving God access to your needs and asking him for provision. Now, let me break up these three words, if I can, that are used in the scripture I'm gonna give you now, but also in 2 Timothy. The first one that he used was supplication. Supplication means this, a specific request. When he said, first of all, supplication, supplication is a specific request. It's the Lord, Lord, this is what I need you to do. I think and I fear sometimes people don't get their prayers answered because they're kind of scared to say to God what they actually want. I mean, chat to Mandy about uh, what she was trusting God for in regards to her husband. (laughs) Specific. I don't wanna get into pride, so I'm gonna just stay humble. Be specific. Lord, I need a new car. I want it to be blue with mags, leather seats, and I prefer the motor to be running. (laughs) Now people say, well, why must I be specific? Well, when my son comes to me and says, Dad, I'm hungry, I say, sure, you can have a piece of cabbage. You hungry? Have some cabbage. Yeah, but if he comes to me and says, Dad, I ate my vegetables and I'd like a chocolate. I'm like, okay, now you're directing me to actually what you want. Then I have the choice to make, no, son, you're not having a chocolate now, you're gonna have some more broccoli. (laughs) Or son, eat your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, and then you can have a piece of chocolate. 
So how many know specific? Number two, when I'm specific, at least I know when I get it that it came from God. Yeah. Some people say, well, how do you know God gave it to you? Well, I asked for a blue Mercedes leather seats, air conditioning that's running. I got exactly that. So who else do you think would randomly come and give me that? When I ask for 100 rand and I get 100 rand, and God knows that's what I asked him for, then how do you know there's a further confirmation that God is working in this situation? Let me give you another, uh, now I'm starting to preach and my time's gonna run away, but another definition for supplication, listen to this, is to beg. I know some of you don't wanna write that down, but let me explain. I know we don't have to beg God. I understand that because we have a covenant. But I think what, what the writer of, of this book and of, of these verses was trying to say to us, it gives us the intensity and the passion and the urgency with which we should approach God about our needs. We were in Imtada this week and Pastor Nomsa was sharing the testimony of her son who God delivered out of a drug addiction, supernaturally. And she was just sharing the testimony and this is what struck me. She said, it came a day when they were worshiping, worshiping God on a Sunday morning and she began to worship and become broken before God and she cried out to God with a desperation, with a passion. She said, God, we all here are worshiping and my son isn't with me. And there was a passionate plea. There was a desperation, a brokenness, a, a determination in her prayer. God, I have a covenant with you. Within two weeks, God had visited him. Listen, he was in deep addiction to drugs. He never went to rehab. He never went on a program. God delivered him. And it's like he walked back into church two Sundays later as if nothing had happened. Supplication, it speaks about in intensity. Guys, I think some of us are just too flippant, too relaxed, too willy-nilly about our prayers and that's why we're not seeing them answered because the devil, the enemy, comes and steals them away before they happen because if they don't happen, we just say, we'll move on to the next thing. Excuse me for being passionate this morning. But I want you to know, I'm desperate in this church. Church, we have not reached anything yet. There are people out there that are dying. There are prostitutes, drug addicts. There are people who need Jesus. And God put this church here so we would go out and win them and reach them and make a difference in their lives. So let's stand up and let's be the people that God's called us to be. Stop letting every little thing be the thing that distracts you and say, one day when I get this sorted out, then I'm gonna serve God. No, today's the day to rise up and be the man or woman of God that God's called us to be. Pray. This word pray in the Greek, listen to this. The word pray here in Philippians 4 and in 2 Timothy isn't prayer, supplication, it's worship. It's the Greek word for worship. So, so when we talk about prayer, we're talking about worship. We're talking about bringing our lives and, and crying out to God and telling God. Part of worship, that, that woman that was the prostitute, she wasn't just coming to worship God. She was coming to prepare him for burial. She didn't even know that. But she was also coming with her life saying, God, I'm desperate for a touch from you. I'm desperate to serve you. I need you in my life. Intercession. The word intercession in the Greek actually means to have an interview. It means to entreat or make a deal on behalf of someone else. Someone else. So let's go to Philippians 4, 6, and I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up in the next, yeah. Verse six, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, say in everything, Amen. through prayer and supplication, let my request be made known unto God With thanksgiving, sorry, let me read it again out of the Amplified. Do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, in every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, say with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. You see, anxiety grips us when we get caught up in it's all about me. 
What am I gonna do? How am I gonna solve this? How am I gonna overcome this? And, and I want you to know, notice what's right in the middle of anxious. I. So prayer, this is what God's saying through Philippians 6. Prayer is supposed to relieve the pressure and the power that anxiety has on our lives. Because when we're caught in anxiety, we're making it all about us. I've got to do this. I've got to change my situation. But when we bring it to prayer, we're handing it to God in humility. And we're saying, God, I need your help to deal with this. All right, number five is waiting on God. Number five is waiting on God. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there. And unfortunately, we won't finish the series this week. We'll pick it up next week or the week after and finish it there. Is that okay with all of you? Did you get some help this morning? All right, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Just for the next few minutes, as they put on a, a worship song. I want to ask you this morning, in the presence of God, in the beauty of this moment, what is God saying to you this morning from this word? From the message this morning, what scripture, what portion, what section has tugged at your heart or caused your mind to come alive that is saying to you this morning, this is what I need you to do, my son or my daughter. We heard through, through Conleen's word this morning that God will break down walls, kick in lies, shine light onto the shadows in your life to, to come after you. He's that passionate about you. Let's reflect just for a a few seconds this morning. If you're sitting here this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, today is your day. You're not here by accident. You're here by God's divine appointment. And if you're not born again, or if you're born again, and you're backslidden, and, and you've walked away from God, or you feel like God walked away from you, today is the day to come back. Right now, raise your hand right where you're sitting. Say, I'm going to be saved today. I'm making a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm rededicating my life to Him. I want to be born again. I need to be born again. I want to accept the free gift of eternal life. Just raise your hands wherever you are. All across the auditorium right now, is there just one person this morning who says, yes, pastor, I want Jesus in my life more than ever before. Father, I thank you for the seed of your word that's been sown into our hearts this morning. Stewards, if you can just get ready with the lights. And I thank you that your word will not return void, but will accomplish that which you please. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to look up and let's just watch the screens.